Hi, this is Greg McLaughlin from the Rebel Base Cart Podcast, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is Hunter. Sorry we're late, Commander. We were putting down an insurrection on Yavik Prime when your comm came in. You shouldn't be down here at all. Well, how else are we going to plan an escape? Freeze! Drop your weapons. <laughs> Blaster beat stick, kid. I'm sorry. I thought this would work. You got us this far. And we're not done yet. This is Vanessa Marshall, Harrison Dula from Star Wars Rebels, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Here we are, friends. It is time to finally talk about Season 3 of The Bad Batch. The first three episodes have dropped on Wednesday, February 21st. So we've got to talk about all three of them on one epic show. And if you've got an epic show, you've got to have epic guests. First, returning guest from the Rebel Base Card, Greg McLaughlin. Greg, welcome back to the show, bud. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm also waiting to hear who, what epic guest you have. Uh, but at any oh. rate, it's nice to be here. Uh, your M count is high, and that includes humility. So thank you for that. Uh, another epic guest that we have, you heard uh, him as we looked at season two of The Bad Batch. He's on, been on different uh, versions of Coffee with Kenobi over the years. So we had to bring back the one and only Mason Zare. Mason, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much. It's going to be so fun to go on season three as it was on season two. I agree. Well, I, I am very glad uh, to do this. We've got three episodes. We've got Conflicted, which is episode 301. We've got Parts un or sorry, Paths Unknown, which is part two. And then episode three is Shadows of Tantus. Um, we'll try to break each one down individually, spend a little bit of time on each one, then we can just sort of spit fire from, from there. But Greg, why don't you give me one word to describe just conflicted and overall thoughts on the episode itself? I'm going to say on the on the first episode, my one word is going to be time, because now I, I would say a little bit of spoiler because the the great um, roundtable episode you did you did just before you know they they talked about it just a little bit they kind of insinuated it, but I would say I was kind of on the lookout for it. But everything from like the dripping water um, to sort oh, yeah. of like Omega's calendar, um, and then the repetition, right? You know, Emery's. Um, you know, greeting for Omega, everything kind of like was marking time. And I think that was something that we kind of had a lot of questions about as far as like how much time has elapsed between the time that, you know, like that we ended last season and the time that we were going to see Omega in this one. But I would just say that is kind of like what they were really reinforcing. And uh, I was totally on board. Excellent. Uh, Mason, what about you? One word and overall thoughts on the episode. I would say my one word would probably be explanatory because this first episode is just getting you into this new season. Like Greg said, that uh, repetition of everything over and over and over, it gets you to know, like um, it makes you imagine like you're being in there and just explains everything for the new season. Well said, well said. Uh, so mm -hmm. yes, I like that too. Um, my one word uh, for conflicted much like I do every time we do this, I still don't know what I'm going to say, which is why I'm stalling for time. It's a great tactic to do in job interviews, by the way. You just repeat the question. <laughs> no, my, my word for conflicted is intrigue. Hmm. It's intrigue. It's, it's a very, it's a slow pace, but it's not a, a, it's not a slow episode. Because the last time we saw the Bad Batch, Tech had met his his. Uh, brave and, and horrible heroic demise. Omega was captured and the Bad Batch uh, was in shambles metaphorically and, and emotionally because of the loss of their dear friends. So all we know is that Omega is trapped. Now the life uh, on this prison base, because it is, I mean, it's, it's really a scientific lab, I suppose you could say. But Greg, you mentioned the symbolism, the symbolism of water that Richard and Sarah from Skywalking Through Neverland uh, brought up to, to Jennifer Corbett and Brad Rao, the Jennifer, of course, being the, um, the head writer and the, the executive uh, producer. And then Brad Rao is the 
is the main director and he also executive producer of the show. They talked about the symbolism of water. Uh, basically, well, I don't want to say what they said. I hope everybody will listen to the show. But Greg, you talked about it too. What jumps out to you about that and why do you think it's important? I, I like the mundaneness of it, the routine. And I think that, you know, it, it, it kind of like establishes kind of like what Mason was saying. It kind of establishes where we are, mm -hmm. but just that this, the, the repetition and this mundaneness of this, the routine, right. You know, yeah. <laughs> think of even like Shawshank redemption, sort of like it's just yes. routine and more routine and more routine, but it doesn't seem like, you know, they are, I mean, they are obviously doing a lot of things to the clones and whatnot, but it's just monotonous over and over again. Like the testing, right? When the test tubes get, you know, uh, Nala Se is testing every day and she's going through and going through, even, you know, at some point trashing Omega samples. It's just sort of like this repetition. And I think it also maybe goes to show how hard this process is as we get later in the episode and we kind of find out what's, you know, what their, what their goal sort of is it does sort of show you that it, there's a lot of work involved and this is not just happening overnight. Mm -hmm. Mason, I know when we watched this, you were the one because they, they do a great job as great mentioned about showing a passage of time. Uh, and these first three episodes are all very clever about, they don't really tell you how much time has passed, but we know that time has passed. Mason, tell us some of the things that you noticed about the indication of time passing. One, uh, the very obvious reason is Omega's hair was growing and as um that second day oh they showed us as it was the second day but it was a long time um they showed the shot of her laying in bed but they didn't show her hair so you couldn't tell and then um also another reason i could tell was because next to her window on the side of the window there are markings of how many days have been passed right and you said dad look at look in the right side of the window and sure enough that's an, it. It's very, very well done. You know, like you mentioned Shawshank Redemption, hard not to think of Escape from Alcatraz or any other prison sort of a movie. And they are in prison, but the reason they're there is because they are experimenting on blood. Now, this is not the first time we've seen the value of blood uh, for characters in Star Wars. Mason, can you remember where we've seen this before? Mm, we, I know we've seen it with Anakin. Yes. Yes. I'm I'm glad you brought up Anakin because Anakin, of course, is where we first learned this. We hear, we keep hearing references to M count, right? We know, and we talked about this with Jennifer and Brad, when you say M count, while they're not saying midichlorian, it seems to me that that is the red flag that we have there. We also saw the, the search uh, experimentation with blood with Groku. That's why the Empire was after Groku, because they wanted to uh, get samples of the assets blood is how they would constantly describe it so there's some interesting sort of experimentation going on uh omega goes through the motions uh with her omega cheer greg i think it's really cool that omega in spite of all this she's still she's still her does that make sense i do like that fact and i think you know you know, it's so funny going back to your roundtable episode, and I really recommend people listen to it because when Michelle Ang starts talking right away, you're like, whoa, that's Omega. You know, it's mm -hmm. like very little things that she do. But, you know, I, I think it's over and over, and it's it's kind of funny, especially her effect not only on Emery, but on cross, Crosshair as well, right? I mean, we I think we went through the first season of The Bad Batch, and, you know, Crosshair was just re really not having any anything of it. But she just kind of wears down people. I mean... Let's talk about the Lurka Hound. Let's talk about Batcher at some point. We um, will. You know, when, when is the toy coming out for Batcher? But, I mean, she just has this effect on folks that, you know, you can just see them. And some of, some of them are easier. They turn quicker. Some of them, it's just a longer burn. But she has an effect. And I, I like that persistence. And I think it plays in again to the episode where it's just like you're just seeing this routine and routine. And she's having this reverse effect on on the people on this base. Mason, what, what do you want to say about sort of Omega and how she keeps her sanity and, and what she does uh, in this episode. I think what she does is perfect. She goes every day and talks to Crosshair, just like updates him on a lot of things. And about Batcher, they should make a stuffed animal of him. <laughs> I'm sure. Oh, I am boy. sure Hasbro uh, is all over that. What I like about Omega here, um, 
we see her when she goes through part of her repetition is she brings this little space tackle box and it's got food inside. It's got little chicken nuggets. That's basically the best way I can think to describe it. <laughs> um, and underneath it, she's got a little hidden compartment that she puts straw in. And over time, uh, it becomes very, very powerful and poignant why that is. Uh, she built her own version of the Tuca doll that she had on the Marauder. And this takes place over a long duration of time. I mean, to me, Mason, why do you think she does that? I think she does that because she misses her family, the Bad Batch, and she just wants to be reminded of those memories on the Marauder with them. And, and I, I, I totally agree with you. And I, and I think this is one of the reasons why we were drawn to Omega and why I think Crosshair uh, can't help but thaw a little bit around her because she maintains a youthful innocence uh, without being jaded to the world because she can handle herself with a blaster or in an escape or in combat, but she's also very quick to be empathetic to others. And I think it's so integral that we see the ingenuity of her building that little Tuca doll out of straw, which is, is a really lovely kind of a metaphor too, because you know, straw is, is used what for warmth, right? For animals, uh, it can be eaten for nourishment, not that Omega is going to eat it. Um, it's hard not to think about, you know, the New Testament and the birth of Jesus and uh, the baby laying in a manger, most likely on straw or hay. Uh, and then she builds it and, and she's able to maintain some semblance of a personal identity, so much so that she is not allowed to have a personal artifact. She's not allowed to have any artifacts of any kind. So they're taking away, you know, part of her humanity, but they still call her Omega. Everybody else is CT99, whatever, but she's still called Omega. Do you guys have any theories? I, I mean, I don't know why. Why do you think that is? Mm. It's a tough one. I mean, you know, one thing I do like also about the dolls, the fact it also kind of reminds us that she is still a child in some aspects. Yes. Yes. And, you know, it just sort of has that, you know, she has, hasn't really had a chance to grow up. But I do like the fact that, well, even Emery uh, is called by. So Emery also does not have, you know, like a, yeah. a CT or a clone designation. Um, but it's, it's funny that Omega gets called Omega, yet I think in the early parts, Hemlock is still not quite aware what her potential is or what her purpose is other than she's important to Nala say. But right. yeah, as far as like a name, it, 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 that is interesting as far as that's concerned. She was the only one, really, other than if there was an alpha at some point that was referred to had another name. It, it's, it's very possible. I, I think it's interesting as well. I'm glad you brought up the fact that you have to remind us as long as that she is still a child. And she wants to hold on to that. Another thing that she does, besides befriending, befriending Crosshair and talking to him every day, like Mason said, is she befriends a creature that is, I wrote it down, is it, is it a... Lurka? Lurka, yes. It's a Lurka. Lurka a Lurka hound. This one, she names uh, Batcher. Mason, tell us about Batcher and how she becomes friends with Batcher. I think she becomes friends with Batcher because she feels so lonely in that place. She feels the potential in Emery, and she is friends with Crosshair. And so um, she has those people but she it feels so lonely with only a few people and how hemlock treats them and mm -hmm. she just needs more like a person having a pet or like a dog it's like that yeah i agree and and do you remember what she does to warm herself up to batcher because batcher is a wild animal uh but she has her way of befriending uh, the lurker do you remember how um giving him the food uh her quote unquote chicken nuggets um because he didn't like the dog food basically right yeah and it obviously is it's working yeah oh is it confined did i say conflicted i i had to i had to kind of look and i wasn't quite sure but i was like you know what no that's either way it starts with a c and it's a very mysterious word yeah exactly so thank you for pointing that out the um I think this is not only is it an important thing because it shows that she needs a friend, but also shows that she is a friend. Never at any point do I feel like Omega is scared. I never feel like she's frightened. I feel like she's lonely. I feel like she misses her brothers. But I think she is so 
loving and empathetic that she sees this wild creature, much like Crosshair, by the way, and she feeds him with positive words and a warmth and a friendly smile and conversation. And then she feeds Batcher with little space chicken nuggets. And they eventually both thaw out uh, to a degree, which of course uh, pays off big time easily. I really like, uh, there's a great section where, where she says, he says, you trust too easily. And she says, you don't trust enough. And that is kind of the perfect precipice of what they are. There, there's a lot of things that I can bring up, but I want to know in this episode, what are some key ideas that either of you would like to talk about before we move on to the next episode? I wrote down, um, was it actions always have consequences as one of the lines in there? And I think Hemlock says that, mm -hmm. but I, I loved, I really loved some of the lines. And I think all throughout these first three episodes and there, and I just think, you know, the writing at this point has gotten so sharp that, you know, there's not, I mean, there's a lot of meat on this bone. It's, it's a very lean meat as well. I think they really, you know, they set up some of these, they set up some of these you know, episodes and then the, the lines just really deliver. Mason. Um, to add on to why uh, they are called Emery Carr and uh, Omega, not just like CT or some other clone mm -hmm. uh, initials. I think it's because um, there are only two girls, as we know, and so there's less of them. So you don't need to keep track of them as much because mm. all the clones could have the same name. And then that's why they need CT because there could be so many same names. Very good. You continue to pass the audition for taking over as host of Coffee. <laughs> uh, the um, what I want to bring up is um, Crosshair is is depressed. He's depressed. He he's developed a tick uh, in a way. His hand, his trigger hand, is what shakes. Uh, is it his trigger hand, or is it the one he uses to balance the the rifle? I think it's both, but mostly the one that he balances it with. I think you're right, because that helps to steady it, because he can still fire, but he can't aim very, very well. Uh, yes, that's true. Uh, the That is interesting, and in, in perhaps that will be something important as, as time goes on. The uh, And I agree with you, Emery and Omega are both female. They both stand out. They're both unaltered clones, so they must be important. Even the Empire realizes that they're important. Um, I really like, um, at the end... Omega has takes a stand, and after she takes that stand, uh, she's very confident. She's like, you know, you're not going to hurt me because knowledge say won't work if you try to hurt me. And then they, he says, yes, but what about your friend? So she instantly worries about Crosshair, and he kind of gives into this little uh, act of defiance. We do learn, to no surprise, that Hemlock, which again, what a perfect name for this guy because he is venomous. He doesn't care about death. He doesn't care. About, he just cares about science in his own twisted way. At the beginning, he doesn't care about the stormtroopers dying. He just wants to turn off the communicator to not hear them yelling. And then at the end, he doesn't worry about what happens to Batcher. Batcher gets wounded, uh, and and she heals him again. What a metaphor for Crosshair. He's wounded too, but in a very very different way. It, it's a terrific uh, slow crawl. It's very, very tense, and it's all encapsulated and punctuated by this slow turning of the wheel, right? Indicating a passage of time, indicating the monotony of their life and their surroundings, and seemingly without end. But this episode is at an end as far as it goes. So let's give this one a letter grade. Mason, what letter grade would you give for this episode, which I did verify in Disney Plus, and Gregor did. It is definitely called confined will i ever learn to wear glasses when i write i don't know apparently not <laughs> i think i will give this one an a because it was an amazing episode an a minus i feel like is too low but an a plus um you have to save for other episodes hey i like your logic an a very good greg I like I like he's not really giving himself you know he's he's giving himself a little bit of a ceiling. Yeah, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna echo that and say also an A. I really like the build to this one. I think it was longer, definitely longer than the second episode, and it maybe is. a little bit of the third. It was about 
you know, 25 plus the five minutes for credits. But I really do think I, I like the pacing of it. I like the introduction. And then, like I said, I was kind of keyed into, you know, the one point as far as like by, by listening to the, to the round table. But I think that kind of like added to the enjoyment because I was kind of looking for things. And, you know, when you go back and you see like the calendar and it, you know, it continues, you know, she's continued to tick it on and, and go through all this. I really like the build up, And I think they laid a lot of good foundations for the episodes ahead. I agree. And, and it, it's 33 minutes, whereas episodes two and three are 27 minutes. So it, it is a little bit longer. Uh, I'm going to give this one an A+. Plus. It's, it's a terrific episode. It's a dynamite debut to season three because it it picks up in in a very uh suspenseful way there appears to be no end in sight but um seeing omega be omega and how she's still able to through her own powers uh of just self and awareness of self able to show love and kindness and still find a way to be stealthy and try to find you know information that she can use uh, to help protect herself and the people that she loves and cares about. And Crosshair, you know, ever since the end of season two, boy, he he is a, he is a a fallen soldier. He is he has lost all of his fight. He just lays there all the time. You know, he's got the shaky hands, um, but he listens to Omega. She is able to give him hope, and it's fascinating. So now we end that one. And we transition into the second episode, which I will verify it is past <laughs> unknown. I was right about that. How about that? Uh, you know the drill, gentlemen. Um, Mason, give us one word and overall thoughts on paths unknown. I think for paths unknown, I think it was a very intense episode. That's why intense is my word. Because um, just when you think all of those slither vines are going to not be a problem, like when Wrecker hits them for the first time. Once you see that, after they do that, you're like, oh no, now it's going to be a problem. And so it's very intense keeping that all compact together. Yes, excellent. Greg, what about you? I'm going to go with suspense. Uh, you know, I think this was a successful build intention, you know, from the Slither Vines on only what I'm going to refer to as Cocaine Endor because that place was absolutely nuts. Uh, you have the dark, dreary former Imperial research base, but I think it's just there was a suspense that kept going. And, and maybe it was, I was more worried about Gonky than I was the rest of the batch, but you know what? I like that <laughs> droid. <laughs> you know, Batcher really has me. I'm, I'm I'm looking for the toy, but like Gonky, I'm like, man, do not leave Gonky behind. So I think suspense the whole way. Interesting. Uh, my word is unfurled. Unfurled because everything is just sort of um, thrown into our laps. Uh, there is no Omega in this episode. I missed her in this episode. I wanted to see more of her, but the way that the vines very much encapsulate the unfurled wildness of their situation. Um, seeing Hunter and Wrecker try to um, do anything they can uh, to try to retrieve Omega. And then a glorious uh, episodic beginning that in shows uh, an, an, an aspect of the Star Wars criminal underworld. I think unfurled is, is where I'm going to go with this. So let's let's talk about the intro. I, I love the intro. We've got uh, Roland, who I believe was from season two, right? Or is he season one? I can't remember. Or at least one similar to him. I just I remember him working with o uh, Omega, and there was something in SIDS. Yeah, because he takes over SIDS uh, right. bar at one mm -hmm. point. And I think right. either but, late one or but two. But they don't seem to recognize one another. One? Not sure. You can I, on Disney+. Plus. Yeah, I'll look it up. I'll look it up while you guys are talking. But uh, he, um, it's it's Roland. He is goes into this throne room. This the animation in the layout of this is absolutely gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Lady Duran, whose first name is Issa, I S A, is the one who is in charge of this crime family. And then uh, we get to see the, sort of uh, echoes of Jabba the Hutt and Return of the Jedi, where someone accuses them of. What does he say? Losing their edge. What does he say? Are they, but they have traitors in their house. 
Does anybody remember what they said? Oh yeah, when the captain is is on trial and then he's really kind of calling everybody out, thinking it that went soft. And of course, when Lady Issa, you know, it's like going to the crowd, it's like, do we look soft? And by the way, Angelica Houston, hello. Um, I I had when I listened when I watched that was this her. Again, I was blown away. Yes, I had to no go back. Way. And, and uh, yeah, because the, the voice was like, wait a minute, I recognize that. Such a commanding voice. Oh my god, so, which I mean, makes sense. I wish kind of the whole episode was was this mission, but I'm I like, too. I, I love I love the detail on this. It, it's really really cool, and and you, we see that Wrecker and Hunter are working as mercenaries because they they were able to retrieve the Pike and the horn to to show who had wounded Roland. Isn't it interesting? I find this really. Um, I need to. I want to talk about this some more at some point. Maybe not on this show. But there are certain species in Star Wars that are they're often stereotyped. All the pikes are bad, right? It was in any pikes that are nice. No. All the Twi'leks are objectified, right? I just find that interesting. The pikes, when we see pikes, we're supposed to assume, oh, they're criminals. And they always are. I just think that's uh, important to just kind of point out to a degree. Mason, anything you want to say about the opening sequence? I think it was very interesting. Um just like you guys said, it's just like Jabba from Return of the Jedi. And um, when he, or no, she pressed the button to make the, like, the captain. walkway appear. Mm-hmm. Walkway appear so they could go to the Bad Batch. And they thought they were going to. Uh, she was pressing the other button to make them fall. They looked down like, oh, no. And then we're like, oh, we're fine. And then luckily they got out of there safe. It's really a terrific uh, opening. And I agree with you, Greg. I would have liked to have seen the whole episode centered around this family. Maybe we'll see more of them. I, I'm not really sure. But the bulk of this episode takes place on a planet. Anybody remember the name of the planet? Do they share the name of the planet? Mm. I don't think they did. I don't mm. think so. I, I don't think that it either. At the time of this recording, it hasn't officially been uh, revealed. But the planet is... It's very, very green. It's very, very murky, very, very swamp-like. And Mason, you mentioned the, the slither vines. Talk to us about the slither vines. The slither vines, like, if you touch them, they will, like, think, oh, no, something is trying to threaten me. And they will come and attack you. And like Wrecker did, when you shoot at them, they co- become hostile. Even though they look hostile when they start, they're really not. I think that's cool that you noticed or that you fi- that you thought, oh, these things only attack when they're threatened. Mm-hmm. That's an that's an interesting perspective because I I didn't take it that way at all. I just thought they were kind of they were carnivorous, which we certainly see mm. at the end. But at the beginning, um, these three cadets are very clear about don't touch the vines. Although we only see two at the beginning. And speaking of those cadets, Greg, um, what are your thoughts on the on these three? We, their names are the leaders, Mox. Uh, we have Deke and we have Stack. Okay, because I was trying to think of the third one's name. I had Mox and Deke down. Stack it's, is the one who stays behind with uh, Mox, okay. and Deke is the one who goes and explores the the, uh, the the base with them. I think it's interesting that they picked you know these sort of like you know teenage clones, for lack of a better word. So it's it's not you know like, I, I think we in the Clone Wars we saw like younger versions of Boba and those kind of ones, but these were mm. sort of like a little older. And you know it was interesting because we hadn't really seen it. It was kind of something we weren't expecting. You probably would have expected to see some haggard haggard clones like you've seen in in, in previous episodes. But you know you kind of get that tie into what the base was, and so I think they they add a little bit of flavor to and rather than just, you know, you find that, and, Oh, we happen to have a console that powers up. So I think they kind of add that. And also they're allowed to have a bit of an arc because they talk about loyalty and, you know, they, they have a little bit of, you know, of conflict as far as like, should we just take their ship and go? Should we help them out? And I like the fact, like I respect, you know, like, so it's, you're kind of seeing them grow as well in a very short time. You have to wonder, are they planting seeds for later? They're obviously, they went to Babu. So, you know, uh, maybe they have a part to play later. Like I said, I was enticed by the Pikes, but I- I'll stick around for these three. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mason, fair to say, we're, we, we watched this thing a couple of times before we recorded the show. Uh, how did you feel? I know at first you were not sure about this episode. Uh, kind of talk about 
how you felt the first time you saw it and then how you felt second. And it's okay. It was exactly the same. When I watched the this episode, Paths Unknown, for the first time, uh, the intro I thought was okay. I didn't pay much attention to all the detail in it. And then the rest, basically, I just thought, oh, this is just the same thing um, with all the Slither Vines. And then when I watched it for the second time, I paid attention to the intro. And I thought, wow, this has a lot of detail to it. Because when he threw the horn from... Uh, what's his name? Uh, Roland? Yeah, Roland. Mm -hmm. Uh, he had the horn, and I was interested how he got that horn Mm -hmm. when they probably stole it a while back. So I wonder where they were keeping it and why they did. And then also for the Slither Vines part, I thought I like paid more attention to that detail. And that thing that comes up at the end looks just like a Rathtar. It reminded me of that, a giant wrath tar and a sarlacc. Mm. I, I thought of the sarlacc, and I, I also thought of um, a charybdis from the Odyssey, which is a, an underwater creature uh, that sucks down all of the water and then uh, with razor sharp teeth and then spits it back up and, and also ignites it and makes it really, really hot and can burn you too. That thing doesn't do that, but it is quite ferocious, really, really ferocious. Um, what I like about this episode, I, again, I will say, it 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 pales in comparison to the first one because I just am so much more drawn to Omega. And Hunter is is profound and interesting as he was in season one and became, while still obviously important and integral to the team, he wasn't as compelling in season two. And Wrecker's never really been the main focal point besides a couple of, of memorable episodes. So these two are probably, as it stands now, the least interesting in the Bad Batch. Uh, and I, and, but even when with them, they're still great. And I still watch a series with them over any, just about anything else. So it was a bold choice, but an important choice because they both have very strong personal connections with Omega. Hunter is the most, the closest to a father that Omega has. And Wrecker is like this doting, loving, big, strong, older brother. And I, I love that. And then we get the intro of the cadets. The cadets, if I'm not mistaken, are voiced by Daniel Logan. Oh, wow. Which is great. And you can tell it. I like the introduction of three cadets. Um, but what did the, what did the both of you think about the cadets as far as like what they added to the story? Uh, what did we learn about Hunter and Record because the cadets are even there? You know, it, it's interesting because they do start to kind of they they give a little bit of background to Hunter and Wrecker of what Hemlock was doing. You because know, they talked about you know sampling blood blood as they're you know they're trying to find out that they said they didn't see Omega mm-hmm. because very she could have been there. You know, we didn't really quite know how you know like how she you know, got to you know, A to B. And I almost don't know like how long this base has been in this fashion. So right. it may not have been that long. And, you know, the, or- the orbital bombardment, or was it the Delta zero, they Delta zero their own base. I had, I had to pause that a couple of times to like, what, what does that mean? But, you know, it, it is kind of interesting that they, they do add a little bit of exposition to, to that. And so it's just not, you know, record hunter on there and going, Oh yeah, by the way, vines. And so I, I like that they add a little, they're, they kind of help us out along the way to kind of give you an idea because essentially, you know, Hunter and record that we have to have them. This is a functional episode. They have yes. to, be, they have to start somewhere. They have to kind of, Hey, this is what we're doing. This is what are on our way for. Um, but they can kind of, they, they still have the luxury of all these extra episodes that they can kind of sprinkle in without having to dump everything on us at once. Right. And uh, Mason, anything you want to add to that? Um, I think they add a lot to the story, especially when uh, I think it is Mux and which Mox, one is M O X. Mox is a leader. Radik is the one that hangs out with them. I mean, um, Stack is the one who wants to take the Marauder and then changes his mind. Mox and Stack, when they are in the Marauder, when Mox looks, I think it's Mox, not Stack. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's Mox. Yep. When he looks at that doll that she was making out of the straw from uh, that place where Hamilton oh, The original Tuka doll, yeah. Uh-huh. He looks at that Tuka doll, and he thinks, 
oh, they really need this member of their squad. And he was telling uh, Stack, I really respect that. We should help them. That's an excellent catch. And I actually missed that mm-hmm. the second time because I was running something down. Yeah, that they, they start the episode with the Tuca doll and they end it with the Tuca doll because, again, it's a reminder, which is a really nice callback to the, to the last episode as far as, like, this child of ours is missing. She is kind and loving. And this is a symbol of her innocence, and we must keep that fresh and intact. So they, they do. Uh, there's really not much to say about the action sequences, except that it reminded me of, of uh, Aliens or Alien Jim Cameron uh, or Ridley Scott's great horror flicks, space horror flicks uh, with the vines. They almost remind me of the Drangir from the High Republic, but I don't think it is the same kind of alien. And almost wonder if they're sentient because they're able to kind of pop up and have legs and run around. I mean, that's just kind of a survival or a predatory technique. The ending sequence with all the grenades was spectacular. And then Hunter saying, make your own path at the end was cool. I think it was great to see them with younger clones. We've never really seen that for an extended amount of time. Uh, There was a lot of great male bonding. And I hope we get to see these three again, because I thought they added a lot uh, just to showing again the human side of the Bad Batch and the fact that they are is for as great and powerful of warriors and as clever as they are and astute. They're even, they have even bigger hearts and that's very, very nice to see. And then they're unlike the Jedi, they can fully embrace that aspect of themselves because there's no code saying they shouldn't. Uh, any last minute thoughts on this or shall we give our letter grades? I love once again, another quote, you know, when Hunter goes, our mission's not over yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like it was a nice way to kind of end that. And yeah, I mean, I, when I was watching back the second time, kind of hanging on that last scene, it was it was really nice. And I, I like the I like the handshake because, you know, if you think That's about cool. like how the clones have treated, you know, Clone Force 99 and these guys knew that they were 99s. Right. Yep. And so it was kind of nice to go. All right. There is a little bit of change of heart. And, uh, you know, maybe maybe more tortured clones will actually go, hey, these guys are actually all right. Yeah. So they must not have their... Didn't they say they removed their chips? Did they say that? Ooh, I didn't catch that. I don't remember. I don't, maybe they don't. Maybe they don't. Maybe... maybe it's who knows? Just since they were younger, maybe they, they didn't do that because they wouldn't add much of a greater stance on the new empire or new republic. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and and they do say, hey, the other our other clones left us behind, and that's right, or or attacked us because they said they were following orders. So, yeah, so maybe they just didn't have them. Interesting. All right, uh, letter grade, and and uh, on the episode before we move on to uh, Shadows of Tantus. Mason, my, my letter grade is an A minus. I think this was an amazing episode oh. with um, that amazing intro. Uh, bringing you in kind of like a hook in an essay Oof. and it's bringing you in there. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the other episodes were also amazing, but I would give this one an A minus. I'm so glad. Cause you've really, you've really changed your stance on this one. Haven't you? Yes, I have. That's so cool. Was there a certain reason why or just going to hit you better the second time? I paid more attention to details and the details of the dialogue and what they were trying to say. And mm-hmm. it had a lot of meaning inside of it. I know I'm your dad and all, but you're a pretty smart, pretty <laughs> smart guy. A pretty smart guy. All right, Greg, what about you? You're also pretty smart. Well, uh, no, uh, I, I would, I, you know, like I need to get on, get on my Sabat game uh, because Mason's <laughs> going to run the table with me. That's so. right. <laughs> kids, kids a baller when it comes to cards and, and many other things. I'm going to stick to my original grade of a B and it sounds worse than it is, but I knew the episode was going to have to going to have to to do something with these two. It was going to have to start. I was very intrigued by the pikes and I, I thought that might've been a little better one at the, maybe the expense of the three clones. I think having discussed this as we have, I'm a little more intrigued with what their potential could be. And I kind of like talking that through because Mm -hmm. there wasn't that much, I think with the other. So maybe this had where, whereas this might've been, you know, a a great in one aspect, it might have some hooks down the road. So I'm going to, all right, I'm going to keep it as a B only because 
I think like you had mentioned it earlier, Dan, we're just wanting to get back to Omega. Like, come on, we know that's where it's going. We know yep. this has to do this function. It's not filler, but it has to start somewhere. And so I, I will only give it that because of those. Uh, very, I really like how you explain that. And I agree, a B isn't bad. I, I'm still kind of vacillating on this, uh, but but I when I watch it, I so appreciate the pacing and the lighting and the suspense of of these vines. Um, a spectacular ending. I like getting to meet these cadets, which could have been just like uh, ancillary side characters that you're supposed to care about and you, and don't necessarily hit, but they did. And we have to see Hunter. And we have to see record and we have to see how they're doing because you can't go, you know, three weeks uh, or however, three episodes into season three of the Bad Batch and not find out how they are dealing with loss because they're also dealing with the loss of tech, which really hasn't come up all that much yet. So I'm giving it an A because it's ambitious. It's really ambitious. Um, and, I, and I think, like you said, it's building towards something really, really cool. But speaking of building to something really cool, we have Shadows of Tantus. That is the third episode. Um, and we probably should squeeze out a little more time for this one because I think there's a lot there. But hmm. Mason, we'll just start with you. Give me um, a one word and overall thoughts on Shadows of Tantus. My one word is plotting because all of the quote-unquote plotting Omega does um, when she rescues herself in Crosshair, because um, Nala say tells her to use the data pad, her data pad, to access the facility and get out. And so, just plotting because of all the plots I have to make. Excellent, Greg. I'm going to go with Batcher, and I think this is a great demonstration of how persistent kindness can reap a positive benefit. And also the fact that if you see some of the group chats I'm in, animals play very heavily in this, <laughs> hi guys. Uh, so pictures of, of cats and whatnot all the time. But I do like the fact that it does show that, you know, like, whereas a lot of folks could, could say Omega, oh, she's always cheerful. She was always doing this. We're seeing some of the benefits of her just kind of being persistently Omega. I mean, it's the only way you can only really, really describe it. And you see at the end, and of course, when Batcher gets to go along, you go, all right, man, toys happening, and we're about to get Gonky and Batcher. And I'm like, yeah, there, there's a series I want to see. Yes, yes, I agree. My word for this is bullseye. I think they nailed this episode. I think this is about a superior a piece of storytelling in 23 minutes or whatever that you could possibly do in star Wars animation. The, uh, the, the surprise characters that show up, uh, the impact and pacing, the fact that there's some really unique, subtle, but effective character development, a fantastic ending. Uh, I, th I think it's an, an almost perfect piece of star Wars storytelling. I, it's great. It is absolutely great. So they, it's a bullseye. Plus, I'm giving a sort of a subtle nod to Crosshair. All right. Uh, as opposed to what we did for the first two, I'm just going to open the, the mic to the two of you and just say, you know, what are some key things, just like we do on CWK Prover when I'm with Tom and Corey, we talk about things that really stand out, uh, effective moments, uh, character pieces, adventure sequences, whatever, as well as things that maybe don't work. Uh, so, Greg, what did work or what would you like to bring up first? And in any order you want. Okay. I, I think I'm going to skip a little bit of forward because I think one thing that, that really surprised me the first time. And again, the second time is when crosshair goes, you got us this far. And we're not done yet because from pretty much day one, crosshair has always been the sort of like the Debbie downer of the group or like, this is, we shouldn't be doing this. This is not what we're doing. That twist of he's really on board and going, you know what? Or your plan fell apart, but I'm totally in on this. I love it. That that was that was one of the big takeaways, and I was very surprised. Mason? I really want to think about when the Emperor was there. Um, what was inside those little capsules of mm. white light? Like, they showed a white light bursting out of those giant capsules, but what is in there exactly? And the emperor tells us nothing is more important to the security of this empire. Mm -hmm. uh, the emperor, I, I want to talk about the emperor because the, uh, I wish it wasn't, I talked to Mason about this before we turn on the mics, but I wish 
I didn't see in the trailer of the Emperor there. Mm. Because when um, that Imperial shuttle shows up, surrounded by a couple of ships, we know there's more stormtrooper activity. Um, you know, Dr. Hemlock seems very much, I won't say he's on edge because he's kind of got the same uh, passionate uh, demeanor and inflection in his voice, regardless of what he's doing. Uh, but it's still sinister. But even he seemed a little on edge. When it opens up, it could have easily been Vader, and that would have been equally awesome. But it's when you see those two red, you know, royal guards, you know it's the Emperor. And then as soon as he opens his mouth, it's Ian McDiarmid, who is, of course, the absolute master of this character and just a terrific, incredible act with that gravelly voice. That entire sequence was so lovely. And it, and it, it didn't feel like a gimmick to say to people, oh, look, we've got somebody from the original trilogy in here. We've got Emperor Palpatine. We've got Darth Sidious, whatever, from the prequels. This is a character that you have to have the Emperor in this sequence. You have to have him more than Vader because if it's really that important to the overall Star Wars story, there is no one more important in the history of evil in Star Wars than the Emperor. So if he's there, if he's that enamored, he doesn't throw out threats, he seems to le legitimately, I won't say he enjoys uh, Hemlock's company. I don't think he enjoys anybody's company except for his own. But the fact that he has that much respect uh, almost talks to him like, almost, almost like a peer. Almost. Thank you. That's a big deal. That's a really, really, really story-wise, it's a huge deal because that means if it's that important to the Emperor and he's making a special trip and no one can know about this base, but he's very happy with the progress of everything, you can have anything you want from the Empire, any resources you need, you've got it. No questions asked, no bartering, no cleverness. That's so important. And then there's a quick scene where they go through that, those great little lasers into the sequence, into that, those like coffins, for lack of a better word, with the life, the light emanating out of them. And Mason, you talked about this. The fact that he has to see it for his own eyes and he's so happy. So, you know, some people, you know, in our, in the empire, We'll think of this as an abomination, but I don't. It's hard not to connect dots and see, oh, wait, they're giving the Rise of Skywalker some some credulity and weight. I mean, that's kind of where my head goes with that kind of thing. But either way, that entire sequence in the gorgeous blacks and reds and the lighting on that, the cinematography, it's a terrific, terrific sequence. And I, I, I could rave about that for days. I still like the fact that he at, at the end of that though, um, Hemlock doesn't get the promotion he's kind of looking for because he's nope. like he clearly has grander ambitions, and that's when you kind of have to take Krennic short. You're like, well, don't choke on him. Yeah, so that, that I I did like All that in at the end because time. It, exactly because then it's like it's not this like whoa he's talking to him like you don't talk to Vader like this man. Um, no, no, yeah, it was it was very a uh, very um. Uh, Testicular fortitude is the word I'm going to use uh, to talk to the emperor like that. Uh, and the emperor turned around and actually looks and says, all in due time. Uh, I thought it was very aggressive, but Hemlock doesn't even seem aware that he maybe pushed it too much. I guess it doesn't matter. Maybe he didn't, but that was just on the edge and it was so cool. And Mason, anything else you want to say about the emperor? I just think even in this episode, especially very menacing. Yes. Oh, Yes. He's, he's, even, he's even dressed like the angel of death with that black cloak. Uh, the escape is fantastic. I, I absolutely love the way Crosshair is supposed to, you know, distract. He's like, hey, uh, open the cell and give me your blaster. <laughs> I'll rank you or whatever. And then he says, you'll see. And the thing <laughs> opens and boom, Crosshair goes to work. Uh, it's just uh, seeing these two together, I can get used to this. Uh, they are... They're so interesting, and I like that he throws Omega the blaster. He's got that super awesome, uh, you know, Apple iPad thingy that the the um, that she uses as she rocks around with that in one hand, and then the blaster in the other. Uh, it's a very very tense escape. That when I watched it, the entire time I kept thinking and worrying they were going to get captured. Something bad's going to happen. What if something happens to Crosshair? It was so well paced. What do you guys want to say about the, the escape? Anything about the escape? 
I really liked um, I really liked Emery that came really close to the edge without necessarily you know completely betraying like her position and things like that and so you she's really keeping it close to the vest but you got a feeling down the road she's going to turn at some point i think omega's just had that much influence on her I and hope. she is a clone so uh, and the one masterful thing that they do actually i don't want to take any mason uh, mason's mason what do you want to say about the escape anything about the escape I really like when they're hiding behind that like control console thing mm-hmm. and they hear two two I think it is uh clones or now stormtroopers walking by and they're talking about the emperor and crosshair goes the emperor is here and Omega's like I don't know and um <laughs> and she says the only shuttle is the emperor's we'll, we'll have to steal it and crosshair goes no we are not when that <laughs> happened, and, and Mace, I know you probably remember this. I was like, "No, they're gonna steal the Emperor's." Like, what a what a great Fast and the Furious episode that would be. Talk about like an amazingly uh, brave and crazy thing to do. The entire episode, much like the first one, but this is even more so. Now let's say has gone out of her way to destroy all the blood samples of Omega. Uh, in episodes one and in episodes three, we find out this project is called Project Necromancer, which tells you all you need to know because of necromancy in the animation of the dead and dead tissue. And so Omega's blood sample is taken. And throughout the entire escape, once in a while we click, it's almost like you would insert a commercial if this were on Disney, the Disney Channel or something like that. And it keeps ticking, like, and it stops at like quarter till, quarter after. And finally, we get to the very, very end, and it's revealed the entire blood sample is circled in yellow, this bright yellow light. Uh, and then we found out it's a perfect match with the M count with no deterioration of the sample itself. So yet again, we find out the blood is important. The blood is the life. It's from Dracula. It's a very scriptural thing. And it's it's going to be fascinating to see what that means, but... It raises the stakes and the suspense of the entire thing. And then at the end, we get to see more of Batcher. And Mason, is Batcher one of your favorites already? Uh what do you mean one of? Like when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to creatures and Star Wars. I don't know what you mean by one of. I think Oh, he's uh, the <laughs> that sentence without one of, yeah. Oh, I see what you did. So that is, he's your favorite. Mm-hmm. Okay. Why do you like him? He very not like he's not like, oh, no, we have to do this. We have to do this. He's just very calm and wants to live a normal life. And did you see who voices Batcher? Mason points out to me. Um, D. Bradley Baker. D. Bradley Baker. Uh, the 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 uh, ubiquitous D. Bradley Baker. The man is the payroll. The man is the entire payroll. <laughs> he really he really is. Uh, there's this great scene when they escape. Um, oh wait, that shuttle, we can't take that one. I know there's one over here, but I don't know where it is. Oh geez. Let's follow the flight plan. When they get to this thing, we get this great to see this great sequence with the lurkas and then this massive creature. It's like, looks like part werewolf, part giant, part plant. Uh, and according to the, to the closed caption, it's a Dryax, D R Y A X. And, you know, there seems to be an unlimited supply of Star Wars creatures. Uh, <laughs> and there are almost never any duplicates. But I, I just think, just from a from a fan perspective, that thing was awesome. It was very much like an Endor Wampa. That's uh, yes. I, I, I got, I got very much Wampa vibes. But you know, I like that hesitation that you know when it kind of turns on. You know, the other Lurkas and you're like, oh, that's that's kind of interesting. It gave it just a just a hint of like, what side are you on? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they escape in the in the shuttle. And I, I when it when it says, you know, the prisoners have taken our shuttle. And I, I laughed and I said to Mason, well, have you seen the Bad Batch? That's <laughs> what they do. Like, if you have a shuttle, don't bring it in to try to capture them because they're going to take your shuttle. Like, you know, they are. They're the Patrick Mahomes of stealing uh, shuttles, I think, in the world of Star Wars. Uh, and it's, it's just good. I mean, I feel like we're kind of selling this one short because you could easily spend an entire episode on it. Again, the plotting uh, of getting the characters from point A to point B, but actually giving us something juicy about them. 
legitimate suspense. I was concerned uh, they were going to get destroyed out of the out of thin air because him like didn't realize what he had, and it was until Emery shows up and saves Omega's life, calls off all of them, and then they jump to light speed, and that's the end. We got to wait another week to see what's going to happen. Uh, any last minute thoughts on uh, Shadows of Tantus? Amazing episode. Is it your Wonder- favorite one of the three? Easily. Yeah, mine too. Greg? One, I was just really kind of surprised. You know, did we really have, like, who had Omega and Crosshair getting out on their own on the right. Bad Batch bingo card? I sure didn't. No. Um, so this was a very pleasant surprise because you kind of felt with the three episodes together, oh, are Hunter and Wrecker going to save the day? They don't. They, they, they don't even quite know where they are. Omega, it's all Omega, which, which is great. I like that twist. We're really seeing some growth for her. And of course, when does the Batcher toy hit the streets? Hasbro, I'm looking at you. It, it's pretty cool uh, that, I mean, it's only the third episode and she's already escaped, but she did it with the help of um, Crosshair, who's not at his, at his best. So it's so we've got the three of them racing across the galaxy, fleeing from the Empire. I mean, come on, this is this is Star Wars one hundred and one, man, and I, I'm here for it. Um, Mason, I, I don't know. Do you think I know you're going to give me your letter grade? Do you think we're all going to have the same letter grade for this one? Yes, I do. I, I think it's possible. I, if I've learned anything from talking with Corey and Tom over the years, you, you never know, never expect the expected. Uh, but Mason, last minute thoughts and your letter grade for this one uh just for my thoughts uh like i said it's just an amazing episode and my grade's an f no i'm kidding it's an a plus <laughs> and um we i just think this episode was one of the best bad batch episodes ever it's easily an a plus excellent greg i'm gonna go with an a on this i really liked you know you you kind of felt this was going to happen you weren't quite sure it was going to happen early you know early on but i really like you know where omega was i like you know that a lot of what she's doing has payoffs right you know and that she continues to to kind of see some of the best in people and have this effect and you know it was really suspenseful we got ian mcdermott back i mean it was really great uh, and i think we're really set up for i mean it's amazing he can be there but yet we still how much more do we know about project necromancer than we did and we're like wow, that's amazing how you left us almost the same way you came. We're like, darn, he's gone. Uh-huh. All right, we're going to have to wait. Uh, I'm going to give it an A plus for sure. Uh, as I as I said at the beginning of this, I think it's a superior episode. It's an outstanding piece of storytelling with great character dynamics, very suspenseful, some great cool creatures, some great one-liners, crosshair. It's You know what? I think what it is, it's fun to finally root for crosshair. You don't get to do that mm. very often. Uh, and it finally felt warranted here. I, I would love to see um, what happens with these two in the ship. And now they've got Batcher with them. So that's quite an interesting sort of a, 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 tr- a tricycle of fun in the world of Star Wars. <laughs> Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are with Dan Z, the podcast you're looking for. This is... <laughs> Well, this little tricycle of fun has come to an end, but I want to thank you both so much for joining me uh, to talk about the first three episodes of Star Wars Season 3 of The Bad Batch, not only for your time and your and your interest and your level of analysis, but also for telling me what the names of the episodes are. That's that's pretty <laughs> important, too. Uh, Greg, please let everybody know what is going on with your, with your fabulous podcast, Rebel Base Card. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, we're just getting ready. Greg Cass and I will be you know, discussing more on the Bad Batch later on in the week and kind of excited because that was the episode, you know, that was, this is the program that kind of brought us together and it was a great way to kind of branch out and try something new, right? I'm all about, you know, collecting, talking to, you know, collectors, people who do cards, people in the community. And this was, this was something that we wanted to try to find not only, you know, like, could this work? Could we keep doing it? I mean, these are long seasons, Mm-hmm. But it was really fun, and then we get to bring people in. You, you know, you've been on before, and it, it's really fun to kind of do a, do a, a slightly different take, um, a, a complimentary one. But it, it's just really fun. That I think it's made doing the podcast, you know, and in, in, in getting to about year six now, 
it, it, it's fun wow. and it keeps it fresh. Um, yeah, it's it, it's been amazing. And then all the, all the different places we've recorded and things like that. And I can't I can't wait to see what he's bringing to the party and everybody else uh, who we're going to have on. And it's, it's just really fun because you get to kind of do a, a roundtable every now and then. And just yes. one of those things that just being in the shadow of. You know the groundwork that the coffee with Kenobi did, and kind of like helping us meet each meet each other, and everybody kind of forms off in, in groups and, and has fun, and everybody's on each other's show, and it's really fun. It's just a testament to what you know, like the, the longevity and the, and the legacy that this particular program and what you have done. You set the table for us, and man, we keep coming back hungry. So you're doing something right. Uh, you're you're very kind. You're 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 just um you're a good man and very kind. I appreciate that very much. Uh, looking forward to it, buddy. I, it's always a highlight to hear the two of you. The, Greg squared, nothing like it. <laughs> uh, Mason, um, you uh, can be found occasionally on CWK Live and um, uh, shooting three pointers on the basketball court. Am I correct? <laughs> yes. Yes, very good. Well, I want to thank all of you so much again for joining us as we talk about the first three episodes of Star Wars Season 3 The Bad Batch. Expect to hear from us every single week and please let us know what you think some of your favorite moments are we've got a top 10 next tuesday because we've got three episodes to talk about so we've got a top 10 of your favorite moments from the first three episodes of star wars season three the bad batch this podcast is not endorsed by the walt disney company or lucasfilm limited it is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only the official star wars website can be found at www.starwars.com star wars all names sounds and any other star wars related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders all original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of coffee with kenobi unless otherwise indicated this is the podcast you're looking for 